ability to understand conversations and lectures in English. The listening section is divided into two separately timed parts. In each part, you will listen to one conversation and two lectures. You will hear each conversation or lecture only one time. After each conversation or lecture, you will answer some questions about it. The questions typically ask about the main idea and supporting details. Some questions ask about a speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speakers. You may take notes while you listen. You may use your notes to help you answer the questions. Your notes will not be scored. If you need to change the volume while you listen, click on the volume icon at the top of the screen. In some questions, you will see this icon. This means that you will hear but not see part of the question. Some of the questions have special directions. These directions appear in a gray box on the screen. Most questions are worth one point. If a question is worth more than one point, it will have special directions that indicate how many points you can receive. You must answer each question. After you answer, click on Next. Then click on OK to confirm your answer and go on to the next question. After you click on OK, you cannot return to previous questions. If you are using the untimed mode, you may return to previous questions and you may listen to each conversation and lecture again. Remember that prior exposure to the conversations, lectures, and questions could lead to an increase in your section scores and may not reflect a score you would get when seeing them for the first time. During this practice test, you may click the pause icon at any time. This will stop the test until you decide to continue. You may continue the test in a few minutes or at any time during the period that your test is activated. In an actual test, and if you are using timed mode, a clock at the top of the screen will show you how much time is remaining. The clock will not count down while you are listening. The clock will count down only while you are answering the questions. Listen to part of a conversation between a student and a librarian. Hi. Um, I really hope you can help me. That's why I'm here. What can I do for you? I'm supposed to do a literature review for my psychology course, but I'm having a hard time finding articles. I don't even know where to start looking. You said this is for your psychology course, right? So your focus is on... Dream interpretation. Well, you have a focus, so that's already a good start. Hmm. Well, there are a few things... Oh, wait... Have you checked to see if your professor put any materials for you to look at on reserve? Uh-huh. That's one thing I did know to do. I just copied an article, but I still need three more on my topic from three different journals. Let's get you going on looking for those, then. We have printed versions of 20 or so psychology journals in the reference section. These are ones published within the last year. Now that I think about it, there's a journal named Sleep and Dreams. Oh, yeah. The article I just copied is from that journal, so I've got to look in other sources. Okay. Actually, most of our material is available electronically now. You can access psychology databases or electronic journals and articles through the library's computers. And if you wanted to search by title with the word dream, for example, just type it in, and all the articles with Dream in the title will come up on the screen. Cool. That's great. Too bad I can't do this from home. But you can. All of the library's databases and electronic sources can be accessed through any computer connected to the university network. Really? I can't believe I didn't know that. 
It still sounds like it's going to take a while, though, you know, going through all of that information, all of those sources. Maybe. But you already narrowed your search down to articles on dream interpretation, so it shouldn't be too bad. And you probably noticed that there's an abstract or summary at the top of the first page of the article you copied. When you go into the databases and electronic sources, you have the option to display the abstracts on the computer screen. Skimming those to decide whether or not you want to read the whole article should cut down some time. Right. Abstracts. They will definitely make the project more doable. I guess I should try out the electronic search while I'm still here then. You know, just in case. Sure. Uh, that computer's free over there, and I'll be here till five this afternoon. Thanks. I feel a lot better about this assignment now. Why does the student go to see the librarian? What does the librarian say about the availability of journals and articles in the library? What does the librarian suggest the student should do to save time? What can be inferred about why the woman decides to use the computer in the library? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. All of the library's databases and electronic sources can be accessed through any computer connected to the university network. Really? I can't believe I didn't know that. Why does the woman say this? I can't believe I didn't know that.
Listen to part of a lecture in a contemporary art class. Okay, I'm going to begin this lecture by giving you your next assignment. Remember, I said that at some point during this semester, I wanted you to attend an exhibit at the Ferry Street Gallery and then write about it. Well, the exhibit that I want you to attend is coming up. It's already started, in fact, but it'll be at the gallery for the next month, which should give you plenty of time to complete this assignment. The name of the artist exhibiting there is Rose Franson. Franson's work may be unfamiliar to you, since she's a relatively young artist, but she's got a very unusual style compared to some of the artists we've looked at this term. But anyway, Franson's style is what she herself calls realistic impressionism. So you've probably studied both of these movements separately, separate movements, realism and impressionism in some of your art history courses. So who can just sum these up? Well, impressionism started in the late 19th century. Uh, the basic impressionist style was very different from earlier styles. It didn't depict scenes or models exactly as they looked. Uh, impressionist painters tended to apply paint really thickly and in big brush strokes, so the texture of the canvas was rough. Good. What else? What were the subjects? Well, a lot of impressionist artists painted everyday scenes, like people on the streets and in. Cafes,、uh, lots of nature scenes, especially landscapes. Good. So when you go to the exhibit, I really want you to take a close look at a certain painting. It's a farm scene, and you'll see it right as you enter the gallery. The reason I think this painting is so important is that it stresses the impressionist aspect of Franson's style. It's an outdoor scene, an everyday scene. It's kind of bleak, but you can really see those broad brushstrokes and the blurry lines. The colors aren't quite realistic. The sky is kind of, well, an unnatural pinkish yellow, and the fence in the foreground is blue. But somehow the overall scene gives an impression of a cold, bleak winter day on a farm. So that's the impressionist side of her work. Oh. And speaking about farms, that reminds me. One interesting thing I read about Franson is that when she first moved back to Iowa after living abroad, she often visited this place in her town called the Sales Barn. And the Sales Barn, it was basically this place where the local farmers bought and sold their cattle, their farm animals. And the reason Franson went there, and she later on would visit other places like dance halls, was to observe people and the ways that they moved. She really found that this helped her work; that it gave her an understanding of body movements and actions, how humans move and stand still, what their postures were like too. So, what about realism? What are the elements of realism we should be looking for in Franson's work? Uh, real, honest depictions of subject matter, pretty unidealized stuff, and pretty everyday subject matter too. Good. One other painting I really want you to look at is of a young woman surrounded by pumpkins. You'll notice that the woman's face is so realistic looking that it's almost like a photograph. The woman's nose is a little less than perfect, and her hair is kind of messed up. This is realism, but then the background of the painting: this woman with the pumpkins is wrapped in a blanket of broad, thick brushstrokes, and it's all kinds of zigzagging brushstrokes and lines, kind of chaotic almost when you look at it close. And there are vibrant colors. There's lots of orange with little hints of an electric blue peeking out. I find Franson to be a very accessible artist. I mean, some artists to appreciate them, you have to know their life story. But here's a little bit about Rose Franson's life, anyway. She attended art school, but was told by one of her instructors that she wasn't good at illustration, that she should go into advertising instead. So she took advertising classes and fine arts classes too, 
until she was convinced by the head of an advertising agency that her work was really good, that she could be an artist. But, of course, it's not as easy as that. And so Franson had to paint other people's portraits at places like art fairs, just to make money to buy paint for her more serious artwork. No matter what, she never stopped painting. And now Franson's doing extremely well, and her work's being shown all over the country. So I think most of us would be discouraged if we had to face challenges and difficulties like that. But what's important is that you keep at it, that you don't give up. That's what's really important to remember. What is the purpose of the... What does the professor say about Franson's painting of a farm scene? Why did Franson go to the sales barn? What does the professor imply about the painting of the young woman surrounded by pumpkins?
Why does the professor discuss Franson's difficulties as a young painter? What does the professor imply when he says this? I find Franson to be a very accessible artist. I mean, some artists, to appreciate them, you have to know their life story. But here's a little bit about Rose Franson's life anyway. Listen to part of a lecture in a geology class. Okay, let's get started. Great. Today I want to talk about a way in which we are able to determine how old a piece of land or some other geologic feature is. Dating techniques. I'm going to talk about a particular dating technique. Why? Good dating is key to good analysis. In other words, if you want to know how a land formation was formed, the first thing you probably want to know is how it's fundamental. Uh, take the Grand Canyon, for instance. Now, we geologists thought we had a pretty good idea of how the Grand Canyon in the southwestern United States was formed. We knew that it was formed from sandstone that solidified somewhere between 150 and 300 million years ago. Before it solidified, it was just regular sand. Essentially, it was part of a vast desert. And uh, until just recently, most of us thought the sand had come from an ancient mountain range fairly close by that flattened out over time. That's been the conventional wisdom among geologists for quite some time. But now we've learned something different and quite surprising using a technique called uranium lead dating. I should say that uranium lead dating has been around for quite a while, but there have been some recent refinements. I'll get into this in a minute. Anyway, uranium lead dating has produced some surprises. Two geologists discovered that about half of the sand from the Grand Canyon was actually once part of the Appalachian Mountains. That's really eye-opening news since the Appalachian mountain range is, of course, thousands of kilometers to the east of the Grand Canyon. Sounds pretty unbelievable, right? Of course, the obvious question is, how did that sand end up so far west? The theory is that huge rivers and wind carried the sand west, where it mixed in with the sand that was already there. Well, this was a pretty revolutionary finding. Uh, and it was basically because of uranium lead dating. Why? Well, as everyone in this class should know, we usually look at the grain type within sandstone, meaning the actual particles in the sandstone, to determine where it came from. 
You can do other things too, like look at the wind or water that brought the grains to their location and figure out which way it was flowing. But that's only useful up to a point, and that's not what these two geologists did. Uranium lead dating allowed them to go about it in an entirely different way. What they did was they looked at the grains of zircon in the sandstone. Zircon is a material that contains radioactive uranium, which makes it very useful for dating purposes. A uh, zircon starts off as molten magma, the hot lava from volcanoes. This magma then crystallizes, and when zircon crystallizes, the uranium inside it begins to change into lead. So, if you measure the amount of lead in a zircon grain, you can figure out when the grain was formed. After that. You can determine the age of zircon from different mountain ranges. Once you do that, you can compare the age of the zircon in the sandstone in your sample to the age of the zircon in the mountains. If the age of the zircon matches the age of one of your mountain ranges, then it means the sandstone actually used to be part of that particular mountain range. Is everybody with me on that? Good. So in this case. Uranium lead dating was used to establish that half of the sandstone in the samples was formed at the same time the granite in the Appalachian Mountains was formed. So, because of this, this new way of doing uranium lead dating, we've been able to determine that one of our major assumptions about the Grand Canyon was wrong. Like I said before, uranium lead dating has been with us for a while, but、uh, until recently, in order to do it. You really had to study many individual grains, and it took a long time before you got results. It just wasn't very efficient, and it wasn't very accurate. But technical advances have cut down on the number of grains you have to study, so you get your results faster. So I'll predict that a、uh, uranium lead dating is going to become an increasingly popular dating method. There are a few pretty exciting possibilities for uranium lead dating. Here's one that comes to mind. You know the theory that Earth's continents were once joined together and only split apart relatively recently. Well, with uranium lead dating, we could prove that more conclusively. If they show evidence of once having been joined, that could really tell us a lot about the early history of the planet's geology. What does the professor mainly discuss? Before the use of uranium lead analysis, where did most geologists think the Grand Canyon sandstone came from? In the talk, the professor describes the sequence of uranium lead dating. Summarize the sequence by putting the events in the correct order.
According to the professor, what change has caused uranium lead dating to gain popularity recently? Why does the professor talk about the breaking apart of Earth's continents? Listen again to part of the conversation, then answer the question. Well, this was a pretty revolutionary finding, uh, and it was basically because of uranium-lead dating. Why? Well, as everyone in this class should know, we usually look at the grain type within sandstone, meaning the actual particles in the sandstone, to determine where it came from. What does the professor imply when he says this? Well, as everyone in this class should know, we usually look at the grain type within sandstone. Hi, Matthew. I'm glad you could come in today. You've been observing Mr. Grable's third grade class for your Approaches to Education paper, right? Um, yes. I go over to Johnson Elementary School, you know, to watch Mr. Grable teach the children in class. It's been amazing. I mean, I'm just learning so much from just watching him. I'm so glad that classroom observations are a requirement for the education program. I mean, it's like the best thing ever to prepare you to be a good teacher. Well, I'm glad to see you feel that way, Matthew. You know, that's the goal. So, I've been reading over your observation notes, and I'm quite interested in what's going on, in particular, with the astronomy unit he's been teaching. The astronomy unit? It seems that Mr. Grable has mastered the interdisciplinary approach to teaching that we've been talking about in class. Oh, okay. Yeah, so like when he was teaching them astronomy, he didn't just teach them the names of the planets, he used it as a way to teach mythology. Really? So how did he do that? 
Well, some of the students could already name the planets, but they didn't know that the names had any meaning. The stories behind them. So he he introduced Greek and Roman mythology as a way of explaining, like you know how like Jupiter is the biggest planet, right? And how Jupiter was the name of the king of the gods in Roman mythology, right? So since Jupiter, the planet, is the largest planet in our solar system, it's like the king of the planets. Like Jupiter was the king of all the gods. Oh, Matthew, that's a great example. Yeah, and each student chose a planet. And then did research on it to write a report and make a presentation. They went to the library to do the research. Then they made presentations about the planet they chose. So, in one science unit in which the focus was astronomy, the students also learned about the literature of Greek and Roman mythology, used research skills in the library, wrote a report, and practiced their oral presentation skills. Exactly. He used this one topic to teach third graders all that stuff. How to use the books in the library to write reports, and even how to speak in public. Plus, they had a great time doing it. You know, Matthew, this is just what we've been talking about in our class, and I'm sure everyone could learn something from your experience. You know, Matthew, I'd love for you to talk about this astronomy unit in class on Wednesday. Really? Um, cause I don't really think I'll have any time to write my paper by then. Oh, you won't need to write anything new just yet. For Wednesday, use your class observation notes and explain the things we've discussed today. Okay, that sounds all right. What is the conversation mainly about? What is Matthew's opinion about observing Mr. Grable's third-grade class? Why does Matthew mention Greek and Roman mythology? What important skills did Mr. Grable introduce to his third grade class?
What will Matthew probably do in next Wednesday's class? Listen to part of a lecture in an archaeology class. Okay, we've been talking about early agriculture in the Near East, so let's concentrate on one site and see what we can learn from it. Let's look at Chatal Huyuk. Um, I better write that down. Chatal Huyuk. That's about as close as we get in English. It's Turkish, really. The site's in modern-day Turkey, and who knows what the original inhabitants called it. Anyway, um, Chatel Huyuk wasn't the first agricultural settlement in the Near East, but it was pretty early, settled about 9,000 years ago in the Neolithic period. And um, the settlement, a uh, town really, lasted about 1,000 years and grew to a size of about eight or 10,000 people. That certainly makes it one of the largest towns in the world at that time. One of the things that makes a settlement of this size impressive is the time period. It's the Neolithic, remember, the late Stone Age. So the people that lived there had only stone tools, no metals. So everything they accomplished, like building this town, they did with just stone, plus wood, bricks, that sort of thing. But you got to remember that it wasn't just any stone they had. They had obsidian. And um, obsidian is a black, volcanic, well, almost like glass. It flakes very nicely into really sharp points. The sharpest tools of the entire Stone Age were made of obsidian, and uh, the people of Çatalhöyük got theirs from further inland, from central Turkey. Traded for it, probably. Anyway, what I want to focus on is the way the town was built. The houses are all rectangular, one story, made of sun-dried bricks. But what's really interesting is that there are no spaces between them. No streets, in other words. And so, generally, no doors on the houses either. People walked around on the roofs and entered a house through a hatchway on the roof, down a wooden ladder. You can still see the diagonal marks of the ladders in the plaster on the inside walls. Once you were in the house... There would be one main room and a couple of small rooms for storage. The main room had the hearth for cooking and for heat. It would have been pretty cold during the winters. And uh, it also looks like they made their tools near the fire. There tends to be a lot of obsidian flakes and chips in the hearth ashes, but uh, no chimney. The smoke just went out the same hatchway the people used for going in and out themselves. So there would have been an open fire inside the house with only one hole in the roof to let the smoke out. You and I would have found it a bit too smoky in there. You can see on the walls, which they plastered and decorated with paintings, they ended up with a layer of black soot on them, and so did people's lungs. The bones found in the graves show a layer of soot on the inside of the ribs. And that's another unusual feature of Chatalhuyuk, the burial sites. The graves have all been found under the houses, right under the floors. And it may be this burial custom that explains why the houses were packed in so tightly without streets. I mean, you might think it was for protection or something, but there's been no evidence found yet of any violent attack that would indicate that kind of danger. It may be they wanted to live as near as possible to their ancestors' graves and be buried near them themselves. But it makes a good point. 
Based on excavations, we can know the layout of the houses and the location of the graves, but we're only guessing when we try to say why they did it that way. That's the way it is with archaeology. You're dealing with the physical remains the people left behind. We have no sure access to what they thought and how they felt about things. I mean, it's interesting to speculate, and the physical artifacts can give us clues, but there's a lot we can't really know. So, for instance, their art. They painted on the plaster walls, and、uh, usually they painted hunting scenes with wild animals in them. Now they did hunt, and they also raised cereal crops and kept sheep. But we don't know why so many of the paintings are of hunting scenes. Was it supposed to have religious or magical significance? That's the kind of thing we can only guess at. Based on clues, and hopefully further excavation of Chatalhuyuk will yield more clues, but we'll probably never know for sure. What is the lecture mainly about? What does the professor imply about the tools used by the people of Chatalhuyuk? What does the professor say about the entrances to the houses in Chatalhuyuk?